And then when I worked in practice, um, in reality, I actually got put off really badly. So I just realised there's so much going on. There's constant headaches. I feel like there's staffing issues, things breaking, chairs not working properly. And it just looked like an absolute pain. Hi guys, welcome to Marketing for Dentists, where we're all about marketing and business for those dentists who aspire for more. I'm here with Arnold as always, he's going to introduce our guest for today. So we are in Bamba Bridge uh, Dental and we are with Dr. Victor Chow. He is um, really somebody that I look up to and that, you know, when I'm ever in trouble, I'll uh, send Victor a message and can you help, can you help me uh, with this, this tricky case? So um, today we just want to find out a little bit about his process, um, getting into practice ownership, how he's been finding it, things that have been helping him, uh, but really excited to have Dr. Victor with us. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, no, thank you so much to Arnold and GK for having us. Yeah, so let's get straight into it. You know, um, we're here in Bangor Bridge Dental. How did this all start? Yeah, so it all started 12 months ago. So uh, so that's when I took over, but there was quite a few months before that. Um, so yeah, so I mean, to begin with, I've qualified for about seven years and um, I've done DCT, so I did my VT first of all, then did my hospital training for a year and went back into sort of general practice, doing sort of mixed as an NHS and private. I was also working in sort of um, a private setting as well. And then that's when I thought that maybe sort of practice ownership might be a good idea. Um, and then, yeah, since then it just snowballed really quickly. And uh, yeah, now here we are, 12 months later. So when I first spoke with you, I think it was over Zoom. It was Instagram first and then, and then Zoom. Um, you were telling me a little bit about how you were investing in yourself as an associate. Um, just tell us a little bit about that, you know, because um, it's not something that, it's not a usual thing for associates to invest in themselves. Yeah, so um, when I first started in my sort of ET, FD year, I just thought, right, how am I going to sort of improve really quickly? And so, um, yeah, I got myself some loops, um, just a really cheap pair, sort of three and a half times my application, the light, um, but it really helped sort of improve what I could see and do. And then I also... Um, my camera set up and so again I was taking lots of photos as much as I possibly could just to sort of improve my uh, game really and what you think is half decent in the mouth when you take a photo and you blow it up uh, then everything looks <laughs> terrible and uh, so it really encourages you to sort of try a lot harder so I did that and then just sort of did loads of courses at the start as well so sort of jumped straight in there and tried to um, push myself as much as I could just tried lots of different sort of techniques um, and then it just sort of improves your clinical um, outcomes really for patients which is more what I've achieved so so um, yeah I thought yeah it makes sense and there was early days as well so uh, the more I invest now I thought I'd get a lot more out of it so it kind of made sense and um, I think if I remember correctly we were talking about you even invested in materials at some point to be able to provide the type of work you wanted to provide? Yeah, so um, so yeah, in my practice uh, at the time, yeah, there's instances where you're not going to get everything on the tap. Mm. So I was going on these courses and I wanted to put into practice sort of um, polishing protocols. I didn't have access to sort of soft flex discs. Um, then I got myself like ASAP polishers, got hand instruments, whether that's um, my composite instruments. Um, and then I even ended up getting things like, like my light cures and things. So I just wanted to make sure I was following all the right protocols. And yeah, I understand a lot of it can be quite expensive. And um, but for me, I didn't want anything to stop me. So I thought I had to do it myself. Um, otherwise, I was just going to limit myself. So and even though um, yeah, it was expensive, but I thought I can make the money back anyway. So um, yeah, I take it early and just get all the materials I could. So. Things were, were going well for you when you're working as an associate. Why make the jump 
to get into practice ownership? Yeah, so um, it's something that I kind of thought about would be a good idea at the very start of my career. And then when I worked in practice, um, in reality, I actually got put off really badly. So I just realised there's so much going on. There's constant headaches. I feel like there's staffing issues, things breaking, chairs not working properly. And it just looked like an absolute pain. And the, the, my principals are always busy and I was thinking, how on earth am I going to do that? So I was put off for quite a while. Got pretty comfortable in an associate. And I was um, starting to get a bit of reputation. I was getting quite a lot of patients coming in through the doors. I was doing a lot more sort of private work. Um, and then, yeah, I was getting my own materials. And the, my vision wasn't quite aligning with where I felt the practice was going. Or I felt that was going to take a long time for me to be part of that to get there. I thought, you know what, I'll just open my horizons and just sort of see what's available. Um, so that's kind of when I started looking at um, the option of maybe having my own practice. And I can really control the way I wanted to work, um, the type of treatments I wanted to do, and then the patient experience as well. Yeah, something that I was thinking about. So at that point when you decided, okay, this is something that I actually want to pursue, yeah. did you have did you have some form of timeline? Did you, you know, create a little business plan? Did you how did you start yeah. to plan, okay, this is how I'm actually, these are the steps I'm gonna to take to actually get to that place? Your vision board in your bedroom. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just uh, affirmations. <laughs> Depends you know the, the real answer is it was pretty much a fluke. So um, what I did was I just thought I'm just going to have a look at the market and I just sort of um, applied on stuff. I think there's a few websites that you can register onto and it sends you some details about practices and things like that that are available. And I kind of just did some research. I looked at where I wanted to be roughly in, within like a certain radius of where I was hoping to live. As well, and um, I'm from Preston, so I know that area really well. And so I knew I was always wanting to be in Preston, and then kind of that was my main search. And then a practice was available, and it was really close to where I live, so it's about 10 15 minutes away. And I've got good knowledge of the area, anyways, and it just made sense. So um, I feel as though I got really lucky. I didn't, I wasn't searching for a very long time, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so I kind of just jumped straight into the deep end. Um, it's pretty much the first one I properly looked at. I had a good feel. I feel as though um, I had the opportunity to really improve it. It wasn't something that was well established and everything was sort of perfect. I felt as though I could come in here, I can sort of take it to the next level and um, at least improve the workflows, make it more efficient. Um, and so the numbers made sense. Um, so yeah. And just took the plunge really. And then I then started speaking to sort of advisors, like financial advisors and accountants to make sure that it was going to be possible to get it done. And was it more a case of you had saved up to a point and then you felt like you're now ready to, you know, um, purchase a practice? Um, how did you approach the whole financial part of it? So, um, Yes, to be fair, the banks are really happy to lend. I feel as though, I don't know much about this, I'm completely new, um, but I feel as though uh, in the dental industry, banks, generally speaking, are pretty happy to lend to us because we're quite a robust sort of industry. Um, so I think the, the amount that I needed wasn't, um, like, it was a lot, but it was like, achievable. So I had all my savings, I saved, basically my entire life savings, is, is put into this um, and then so yeah I did some forecasts uh, and then from there I thought right I, I know where I'm at I know my risk level as well and it kind of made sense um, and I did have the option of do I want to do squat do I want to do existing practice um, but this I felt was the right move because from a cash flow point of view I've got existing patients, which I'm buying into with the goodwill. I just I thought, right, from day one, I'm going to have loads of patients. I'll be absolutely fine. Um, so my business plan wasn't massive. I didn't have to do a lot of work behind the scenes. A lot of it was actually done for me because 
and purchasing existing products. I've got all the data there, so I didn't need to um, have like a, a big, big plan yeah. uh, compared to if you're going to do a squat, basically. Right. So, I mean, as an associate myself, you know, I might look at it and think, you know, you become a principal, you've got other dentists and clinicians working for you. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So did, did you just tell us about the difference yeah. between being an associate, when you're an associate to you now being a principal, what, what are the differences, if any? So, yeah, so I mean, uh, no one teaches you this sort of thing at dental school. So when, when you come out, there's, there's no knowledge about dental business or ownership or anything like that. There's barely anything about the NHS. Uh, and so, yeah, there was one day I literally got given the keys by the old owners and he's like oh yeah there you go that's it like congratulations <laughs> handshakes and um, yeah I was like oh geez, like, what am I doing uh, like suddenly I don't know if you know if his voice like sort of sank in yet and I was like oh right suddenly I've got a lot more responsibility mm. um, so yeah so in terms of the challenges and the differences I mean I don't have much free time anymore so I've definitely lost, like, in terms of like, work-life balance, it's like almost all work. Mm. So I feel as though I've definitely sacrificed a lot this year. Um, I feel as though, I mean, some people may get it, um, probably would do it a lot more differently to me. But I felt as though I just wanted to jump in there, be part of the team, um, trying to learn every aspect of every person's role. So um, whether I'd start a completely new way of doing things, it's all paper-based something that I'd not done before, other than dental school. So I wanted to sort of see how that ran. So I didn't see any patients from the first few days. So I just wanted to see how the existing practice was working. Um, and then I made sure I knew how um, even decon ran. I mean, no one's really taught me much about doing decon as an associate. You never have to even think about that. Um, but now I kind of know it inside out. Uh, I've suddenly become a bit of a, an engineer. Like constantly fixing chairs, <laughs> had to do so much with DIY, like things breaking, simple things from like a door handles are not working properly. Worst nightmare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lights are broken, um, three and one tips are leaking, so all this stuff. Um, to be fair, I, got, I feel as though I've got really lucky, the team have been supportive. The previous owners stayed on as well. So that was a massive bonus. Um, so something that you insisted on, that they stay on for a bit, how did that work? Yeah, so luckily they actually wanted to stay on. So, um, so yes, yeah, part of it, um, we had like a friendly agreement that they actually wanted, they didn't want to leave, they didn't want me to just boot them out. Um, so, yeah, and that was favourable for me. Uh, I mean, you can have different viewpoints of it, because, mm -hmm. I mean, some people might want to go for um, a wholesale changes and just, completely convert the practice um, but I wanted to sort of evolve the practice from where it was to where I wanted to be and um, so I've kind of taken steps um, along the way. I did make some big changes um, but luckily they were on board um, and the, the existing team have kept the majority of them as well mm -hmm. and they've been happy and they've followed me through those um, that step and yeah. um, it's been quite exciting for them to be fair. So, uh, at least I like to, I like to think that, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, and the team's actually grown as well, so it's actually grown quite um, a little bit as well. So, so we're talking with, sorry, sorry, I was just gonna say with the changes. Tell us a bit about how did you? Because obviously, change can be a bit difficult one, especially if people have always done what they've done for such a long time. How did you kind of plan out the change to be such that it was not too much change too quickly and that sort of thing? So, yeah, so that was a bit of a judgment call, really. I mean, my biggest change was definitely digitising the whole place. Um, and I just knew from day one that it had to be done. Everything's going that way anyways. Um, it's only a matter of time. And um, I'm going to be honest, I, I've not done paper charts. Like me, my handwriting is <laughs> terrible. So everyone's going to struggle to read what I'm going to be writing. Um, so I thought, right, pretty much from day one, I knew I had to digitise it. So I'd done quite a bit of work before I took over, like researching dental softwares, um, how I was going to get um, the electricians in to rewire the whole building and uh, to get the internet sorted. So when I came in, the internet was absolutely terrible. Um, and yeah, quite a lot of my technology and things and that just was going to be impossible.
possible. Um, so it, it sounds simple, but when you're talking about having to get the wiring sorted, everything installed, yeah. um, how was it getting the team to then also adjust to all this digitization? So yeah, so it was a bit of a struggle. So uh, in some ways, so the team were very, very sort of traditional, everything was paper, and a lot of them haven't been, used, not even like computers and things, they weren't really that into even iPads and laptops. Mm. They had two computers and that was purely for blocking patients and sending off like a few NHS claims. Um, so I had to pretty much do it from scratch. So um, we got, so I've decided to use Dentally. Um, so I got the, the um, training involved um, and then I had to just spend a lot of time basically just being on the ground and at least they knew they could trust me to get them out of trouble. Um, so I, I was a bit like that in my old practice. I was almost the IT guy anyways. So as soon as anything went down, if there's printer issues, I was always sort of nominated to be that person to fix things. So when I came into this practice, I, I've got a reasonable knowledge of computers and things. Um, so that was uh, yeah, something I could fall back on at least. And then and the IT company had been great as well. Um, and they came in and were really, really helpful. Um, got a telephone company in, and again, more challenges with that. So before it was um, your sort of standard telephone system. And now I've gone for um, a voice sort of internet sort of telephone. And again, that comes with your challenges. So if the phone line, if the internet goes down, everything crumbles mm-hmm. uh, and that has happened. Um, and there's been days when they think, God, it, like, we had to go back to paper. And mm. they think, oh, I see, we should have stayed on paper this whole time. <laughs> uh, it's so much easier. And, um, but yeah, I mean, we survived somehow. I, I was like, I had to go like BT Open Zone. And I had to like, uh, use my data over the phone and all that stuff to get around it. Um, and someone had conveniently cut the cable to our building. Wow. Um, by mistake, apparently. Uh, and it was the BT guys as well, uh, so I had to get them in. It took them a few days to get back. Um, but luckily, I was on dentally, so um, I could get mobile internet things like that. Uh, so we kind of got around it. Uh, and the telephone company were quite handy. They managed to sort some stuff out sure. and get the ground on board quite quickly. So, uh, but yeah, some challenges. Uh, but there's more technology to come. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just trying to push it because it's just gonna make our practice more efficient and things. So. That makes sense. And, yeah, brilliant. And also, obviously, we always talk about marketing and systems and that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. how did you start to incorporate things like, you know, looking at the patient journey, the patient experience and other forms of marketing? Tell us a bit about that. How did you start to uh, incorporate some of these things? So um, so what we've since done is um, before the patient comes in, the practice, they used to have to uh, physically write letters um, to uh, for the recalls. Right. So they'd, they'd have a system, which was quite nifty to them. I didn't know about it. I've never seen it before. So they would have to write on a, like a postcard, yeah. uh, the patient's name, um, the address. Yeah. And then that was the recall system. And so obviously when I came in, um, everything's via text now, yeah. automated. So again, it's just it's just more efficient, like just better use of the staff's time. So that's all automated. You've got emails as well. So we're collecting all that digital data, which before it was just super analog. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we had quite a lot of like home phone, but there wasn't very many email addresses and telephone, uh, like mobile numbers. Uh, so now they're getting text messages, they're getting emails as well. And um, when they come in, um, we can also send them their medical histories um, before they come in as well. Again, just saving that extra time and especially the more tech savvy patients, um, yeah. they enjoy it because they're kind of used to it. And COVID has helped as well as part of it. So um, I think that's a bit of a bonus. And because of COVID, patients are kind of more accustomed to that sort of journey anyways. Um, so there's less resistance. And we do also have the paper forms as well. So yeah, we go through that. Um, in terms of digitizing again, so 
before it was analog x-rays where I was posting it via the Delapex and then it would take quite a few minutes. So often the patients didn't even see the x-rays or they didn't get it reviewed straight away. We, they would often telephone the patient after they left to tell them the report. Um, whereas now it's pretty much instant on the TV, straight away, they're blown away and they're thinking, wow, I've never seen this before. Uh, and yeah, the patient feedback's been great. They're like, wow, oh, I've never seen my teeth like that on the screen. Um, same, I've got the Itero as well. So I'm yeah. scanning patients, they're seeing the teeth again on a big screen in um, 3D. And again, they can kind of go, oh, wow, well, yeah, there's problems there, there, there. Um, kind of hopefully just improves the patient experience. Yeah. Um, Me and Chico were just discussing earlier about some of the things that you've put in the practice that you probably even forgot that you've done, but that make a big difference. So the other day I was in, um, in Nando's and what they ask you to do is to scan on the table. You make your order, then they deliver. Yeah. Um, it's just something that people are just used to nowadays. Yeah. So one of the things that we saw was the fact that you've got QR codes in the building for patients to be able to scan and get to your website, to your Instagram. Um, where did that all come from? Just the know-how and the awareness that this is important to be doing. Because with that, you've got the QR code outside actually as well. Mm -hmm. So people walking past can actually scan it. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I feel as though, yeah, when you're out and about, you just see it. And um, yeah, I've known about it for ages. It's just a super convenient way of doing things really. And it just made sense. So... Um, Had you seen it in the dental practice before? No, no, so I've not seen it, but... Um, even before COVID, I was already doing that sort of thing uh, as an associate. Um, and I thought it was just a simple, easy way of just guiding patients to where you wanted to go. Um, and yeah, I feel as it's been around for a very long time. And so, You've been living in the future for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you got super popular in COVID, but it's mm. been around for, yeah, what seems like a while. Yeah. Um, so I used to have it on my TV. And so um, as an associate, I used to have a QR code straight to Instagram anyways. So then like, patients often want to see what I'm doing in terms mm -hmm. of my work, my portfolio. So it's like, oh, I'll just have a look at that and you can just check it out straight away. Nice. Um, and then that's just since evolved. So they were doing appointment cards. Um, so I was like, well, it makes sense. Let's put the QR code in that. And everything is an opportunity, I thought. So unless you spell it out to patients and so they can reach you, um, yeah, you can't really get any words out. So I made sure that I've got QR codes everywhere, I've got telephone numbers, email addresses. So it's all written. So they've got all the forms there mm. um, so they can access it whenever they need. So if anyone's walking past, you can see it straight away whether they want to manually type it. That's just too much effort nowadays to scan it. Um, but saying that, I mean, even like the iOS software now, you can, um, on your phone, yeah. you can you click that button and it changes it to um, text and things. So you can get the numbers, which is a bit easier, but I've got QR codes even faster still for most people. Uh, so yeah, I've dotted it around, uh, whether that's in surgeries, on their business cards or appointment cards to mm. outside. So I thought, yeah, I thought it was just a nifty way of doing things, really. Yeah, yeah and, and then obviously from a conversation, you've been wanting to do more private cosmetic work here. Uh, what kind of things have you done to attract more of that sort of patient? Yeah, so at the moment, um, a lot of it's just uh, word of mouth. Um, so I'm not really uh, invested in a lot of marketing or anything like that. A lot of it's just been purely organic. Um, so I do post when I can. I'm just too busy at the moment with my Instagram things, uh, especially the principles, it takes up so much time. Um, so yeah, post every time I post a case, I feel as though I've got patience on the back of it. <laughs> Um, and every time I treat a patient, um, yeah, it just spreads really. And mm -hmm. it's, oh yeah, this person I recommended you use. That person said you've done that um, their teeth, done the composite pumping, and this one thing. So it's just kind of snowballed really quickly. Uh, and at the moment, I've actually got no, uh, not enough time. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to sort of increase my capacity, whether I'm using therapists and things. Um, because I'm just too, too busy. So I, can't, I don't have enough time to to get the new consultations in and uh, to do bigger cases. Yeah. Uh, it's been a bit tricky from that point of view. Uh, so, sorry, I guess, where do you get support from? So before, 
When you're a foundation dentist, you're a trainer. When you're an associate, there's a principal. Now you are the principal. <laughs> Who do you go to? Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've got um, quite a few friends. I'm still messaging. We've got our, like um, WhatsApp groups and things like that. We're discussing cases. I need to give a big shout out to Daniel as well. So he was one of uh, my principals. And yeah, we just share um, a lot of our energy together, discussing different ideas. Um, he's kind of a bit like a bit visionary as well. So we're always testing. And yeah, I used to love it um, when I worked in Bury. And um, we used to spend so much time after work discussing every case. Mm. And we still do that now. So if we've got different techniques or if we've got challenging cases, we do bounce off each other. Um, and yeah, I've got a few colleagues like yourself as well. I'll, mm. I'll reach out to you if you've got um, sort of ortho questions. Um, and yeah, but I'm still learning as well. So I'm still going to courses myself. Um, yeah, I still I feel as I'm still quite early on in my journey. Um, so much more to learn. Um, and yeah, whether it's a younger dentist as well, I mean, they've got, they're coming out um, really, really eager. They've, um, nowadays, there's so much out there as well on social media. I think it's a lot more accessible. Whereas when I started, I don't think it was the case. If anything, if you post, I feel as though you just got grilled. Like, a lot. <laughs> like, even now, I feel like I am always conscious that um, anything I do post, I feel as though people are judging me all the time, um, critiquing my work, things like that. And I, yeah, I do have that sort of imposter syndrome where I feel as though, yeah, I'm just um, sort of quite a simple general dentist, just trying hard really. Um, and then hopefully people like what I do and then I've just been built up my patient base from that. And on, on that, you, you touched on imposter syndrome because obviously clearly it's not that big because you've been able to do what you've done here, you, you know, you've got this practice. Talk a bit about the mentality that, because you must take a lot mentally to be able to actually start your own practice. Talk a bit about, yeah, the kind of mental shifts that you had to yeah. take for you know, buying the practice, being able to run it, you know, be, being able to lead the team as well and stuff like that. Yeah, so I expect, um, so yeah, I give myself like um, sort of big goals, um, I always try and push myself as hard as possible. Like um, I've never been sort of scared of hard work and things like that. Um, I've always pushed myself as much as I can. Um, and I feel as though that's shown in the practice. So I'm pretty much always the first one here. I'm always the last one to leave. Uh, I'll get stuck in um, if I need to with even the simple tasks. Um, and then, yeah, I give myself um, really high expectations of what I expect of myself. And hopefully that rubs on to my team, that rubs off to my team as well. So they can see that I'm trying hard to make sure that their lives are comfortable um, and try and make sure I look out for them. Um, um, getting all the resources, if there's any issues with lack of equipment, I'm straight on it. I'm not getting it done and sorted um, in terms of patience and things. Any of my colleagues have any issues, mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, I'll just send it my way, and I'll take over. It's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got an open door policy, and what I've done is since I've um, started, um, I've implemented a huddle mm -hmm. um, every single day, um, fifteen minutes start of the day. Um, I thought it made sense, um, so and then I gave my team an extra hour back um, on the Friday, so we finished a bit earlier. So um, they're still pretty much doing the same hours, but coming 15 minutes earlier, we all get together and then we can discuss like, what we need to do to have a good day. I know any issues, so I'm still learning um, and it could definitely be more streamlined, um, but I felt that was the right step. So um, yeah, so we can iron things out, any issues with patients, potential problems, anything that breaking, just let me know, let the team know, perhaps imagine it, right, let's go sorted. Um, things like that um, and yeah I'm listening to a lot of uh, other sort of like podcasts and materials and it's just like open my eyes to see like how other people do things so it can keep sort of levelling up slowly step by step uh, in sort of all aspects really yeah. and then clearly I'm sure if we open you up we're going to find some wires inside you're, you're a machine <laughs> yeah. you work so hard yeah. 
surely at some point you get tired. <laughs> so, oh yeah, no, absolutely. And because you're, you're leading the team, doing all this. Stuff. So in those moments where you're tired or you feel like, do you know what? I, I don't want to do this anymore. Whatever. Yeah. Like, what are some things that you go to to just kind of rejuvenate, refresh yourself, and that sort of thing? So yeah, this year, um, yeah, my work-life balance is really poor. So when I was associate, oh, it's great. I was playing badminton regularly. I was going <laughs> to the gym. Um, and I was like catching my knees, things like that, and it was fine. Um, but this year definitely has taken a toll. Like, literally, since I've started, I've barely done any sport. Um, I've got gym membership, I've not turned up mm. at all. Um, and yeah, to refresh, it's really bad. So, um, after hours, there's so much paperwork behind the scenes, mm. and I'm definitely doing it wrong. Mm. And one thing that I need to learn is to delegate a lot more. So I'm definitely um, probably overworking, I'd say. Um, but at the moment, I'm still young. I've got plenty of energy, and I don't have that many responsibilities. So I feel as I can do it. Um, but there's only so much I can do, and I need to definitely scale back. So behind the scenes, I've been putting sort of a lot more systems and processes and trying to make things more efficient so it'll run itself eventually. And sort of like guides and things. So yeah, to relax at the moment, um, yeah, it's pretty sad. I'm just uh, <laughs> TikToks and things like that, uh, YouTube, uh, um, try and meet um, more dentists and yeah, my friends as well. Um, so yeah, off to the pub and things like that, but just not as often as I want. And people know me that every time I go to the cinema, I end up just falling asleep. Uh, and it's so bad, I'm literally spending a tenner just to yeah, fall asleep. Because yeah. <laughs> after those times when I am relaxing, I just, I just need to recuperate. So I'll go home and I am usually absolutely shattered. Um, cinema is perfect conditions. Yeah, I it is. Yeah. So you were watching a three hour superhero movie, you're like, come on now. Like, I'm so like, well, ask my friends, I'm so bad for it. Like, um, and the one in Preston, I don't know if you've been, <laughs> Um, yeah, the chair, like the sofa is so comfy. The recliner, <laughs> uh, capital centre, yeah, like the recliner chairs, like all of them are recliners and then so as soon as you get in there, and I'm like having a, a nice blast and everything, trying to like energize myself. Like, mm-hmm. like oh, I'm literally like ten minutes in, I'm just asleep. Uh, so, what, what would you say? Is there like a saying, a piece of advice that's always stuck with you that helps you to continue to persevere, with, whether it's through your career as a dentist or through your time as a principal? Is there anything that you fall back to? Um, or, I'm sorry, I'm just add to that okay. question as well. If you can also touch on. I mean, your family, parents, is there something that, you know, is it, where have you got that work ethic from? Sorry, yeah, just to answer that question. So, yes, in work ethic, yeah, definitely my parents uh, and my family, like everyone in my whole family, I feel as though we've always had to graft. Um, so I feel as though, yeah, and that's kind of set the tone. So my parents are still working and they gave me all my opportunities. So they pretty much work, what, six days a week and have done um, ever since I can remember. Um, I think they used to do possibly seven days a week at some mm-hmm. point. Um, and they'd always work, you know, really, until really late at night, so I'll go home and they're still working. And yeah, growing up, um, yeah, that's pretty much all sort of like local Chinese, um, British people, um, yeah, in the takeaway. Uh, so I've seen that my grandparents did the same um, so I've seen it from that point of view, and I just don't want to, don't know, don't want to let them down. Um, and so yeah, so from day one, I've always tried hard um, at everything I do, because um, they've, they've sacrificed so much to give me like an easy life. Realistically, um, all I had to do was study really, um, and yeah, they provided everything for me. So I think that was a big factor. Um, I feel as though I've always wanted to prove people wrong as well. Um, so I'm not sure why that is, but um, I've always wanted to show that I can I can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's a challenge. And um, so yeah, I've, I've always tried to craft harder than the next person. Um, I've always, because that's something that I feel as I can control. So I might not have everything, like I'm not naturally gifted and not naturally smart and all those sort of things. I feel as if I've just put the hours in um, to get what I want or to 
achieve uh, what I want to achieve, and I still need to keep on going to get mm. to, I know, to keep to get to the next level really. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one of the huge sort of influences. So yeah, parents, grandparents, um, yeah, seeing everyone like we've all pretty much my whole family have come from that sort of background really. Um, not they've not been to like um, sort of college or you know university or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it kind of kind of made sense for me to um, add on a plate. So we were you the first one to go to university. Pretty much, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, grandparents can't really like, read or write. Um, and my parents came; they had to work quite early on, uh, so they didn't really get like didn't really get like GCSEs or anything like that. I mean, they might have got a few. I'm not sure what they called it back then, like O levels or something, something along those lines. But um, most of my aunts and uncles did it. Mm. Um, go to university. I think I've got one. Um, my aunties, because we've got a really, really big family as well. So they, they had she went to university, but other than that, pretty much like my generation pretty much there. Wow. Uh, so uh, yeah, so yeah, I was pretty lucky from that point of view. Like really, really lucky. I, I could go to uni and things. Um so yeah, so yeah, just channeling the rest of it really. Now you're here running down the bridge dance yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and having referrals from dentists like myself <laughs> to yeah. get us out of trouble. Yeah. No, um, definitely amazing what you've done here and what you continue to do. Um, like I was saying before, um, you're showing what can be done as mm. a dentist, uh, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, no, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's great for like to have people like yourself and you, Chico, as well. I mean, yeah, you came in at some point when I was still an associate, mm. and yeah, it. Just open my eyes, really, and I think that's what you need to do. Um, yeah, just keep your eyes open, see what's around, see what opportunities are out there, keep learning, and then yeah, bounce ideas off other people. And like yourself, um, yeah, it's great uh, for you to come in and shadow. And then I'm sure you're going to help me out loads in the future as well at some point. Yeah, it's going to be one way. One way. One way. Yeah. One way. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, no, it's good, and I think it's. It's really important as well, I feel. It's like, because our community is quite small and I feel as though dentistry can be really difficult. So I feel as though you do need to help each other out as much as you can, like back each other up. Um, if someone's in trouble, yeah, just throw it my way. If I can help, I'll definitely try my best. Because um, I don't know, we're for the patients and then we need to look after one another as well. Because, um, um, yeah, it's quite tough out there. There's enough people trying to get us. So we need to back each other up. No, totally agree. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's been absolutely amazing. And I'm looking at time. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably yeah. time to be getting on. Well, time to be, to be getting back to the paperwork. I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, like, what quality, yeah. <laughs> amazing. Uh, Victor, if anyone wants to find you, you know, for any reason whatsoever, or this patient, any other dentist, I want to get more stuff because I'm sure people want to hear more about your story, about you. Where can they find you? Yeah, so yeah, feel free to um, drop me a message on Instagram, for example. So it's um, Dr. Victor Chow, or um, you can also find me at the Bama Bridge Dental Care Practice. So at Bama Bridge Dental Care. So yeah, those two are the main areas. Just to uh, yeah, check me out and uh, yeah, drop any messages, any questions. Yeah, have to tell. Awesome. Yeah. Any final things? On? No, I think it's just an amazing example of how you can start out as an associate and really take the whole journey into becoming a, a practice owner um, and really being in the thick of it. So I'm learning from uh, Dr. Victor's example. I mean, what are your thoughts, Chica? Absolutely, yeah, it's amazing. I think I'm not a dentist, but looking at it from just as a human being, just your story is absolutely inspiring. It's amazing to see you know, where you've come from, the work that you've put in to, to get to where you are here today. I think it takes a lot of imagination, a lot of you know motivation, inspiration to get to where you are today. So absolutely amazing. So guys, please do follow Victor. Do ask him questions. Uh, do remember to follow Martin for dentists as well. Uh, thank you very much for watching and listening to this. We'll see you in the next one.